Okay, so just to give a bit, of, a little bit of an introduction to our presenters today, we've got John Hornsby, who is an engineering director at Fenster Making Associates. She's been involved in this watershed study and planning process with Cauchy Paris since its inception. She will be guiding you all through the majority of the information in this presentation. Joining us today is also Gary O'Neill, who is the market leader for grants at Fenster Making Associates. He is also the liaison for LFMA, and he is on the board of directors for the um, NHMA. So he'll be joining us today to discuss floodplain management and freeport. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Jean to get us started. Thank you, Raul. First, I would like to welcome everyone to our third webinar series on Let's Talk Drainage. Today, we're gonna discuss policy and particularly how policy relates to Calcasieu Parish. What are some of our current policies? What are some recommendations to the parish and the municipalities regarding policy? As well as kind of what does our future look like? The purpose of this webinar as our entire webinar series is to get feedback from you, the constituents, um, on what do you, are you looking for and what is that best balance? So before we get started, we're gonna hear a short message from Terry Freelo with our Department of Public Works with Calcasieu Parish. Good morning and welcome to our third webinar of our four part series, Let's Talk Drainage. Hi, I'm Terry Freelo, Assistant Director of Engineering and Public Works for the Calcasieu Parish Police Jury and also the Project Manager for Calcasieu Parish Regional Watershed Study. I hope that you find this format convenient for those who want to participate in the long term drainage plans for Calcasieu Parish. Directly behind me is the Cauchy Cooley Watershed Pump Station. This pump station is used to move water from the Cauchy Cooley Watershed Basin into English Bayou. However, without the right policies, a project like this would not be effective. The focus on this webinar is to talk about policies. Policies are used to protect our public and private investment in our communities. With the proper policies in place, our community we become more resilient towards flood hazards. Today, we encourage you to participate in this webinar in our online chat in a survey at the end of the webinar. This survey would help us answer your specific questions as it relates to policies that will be included in our long range watershed management plan. Before I turn it back over to John, I'd like to give thanks to our police jury, our administration, and of course, Alan Wainwright, our division director of public works for entrusting me with this project. I also like to give thanks to Fenster Makers, John Harnsby, who's been our host for the past webinars and her staff, and of course, Anna Doucet, who will be presenting in the next webinar. I'll turn it back over to you, John. Thank you, Terry. As Raul mentioned, we'll be using Poll Everywhere throughout this webinar as we have in previous ones. So we ask that everyone continues to join us via app, web, or text, and we'll be getting feedback. Other things, as Terry mentioned, and as well as Raul, that you can place your comments in the chat box throughout this webinar, and at the end, we're gonna answer as many of those questions as possible. In addition, the survey, we will provide a link at the end. This is to get more input and feedback. Um, you'll be able to rank policies and give us your thoughts on which ones are best for our community. So to get started, you may recall that in previous webinars, we talked about what watershed management was, particularly the three main components that make up watershed management. In our prior webinar, we covered programs. Today, we're gonna to talk about policy. In our last webinar, we're gonna cover projects. But today, for policy, policy is defined as a course or principle of action adopted by a government, party, business, or individual. Many words are interchangeable with policy, ordinance, laws, things like that. So we're gonna cover these. But before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone, please have an open mind. Policy is one of those things that you can take it to different levels. On one end, if we have really extreme strict policy, it can protect the individuals in place, but it may hinder our growth and development. On the other extreme, we may encourage development that comes in, but not protect our people. Someone once told me that we can limit deaths on the interstate quite easily. We'll just change the law, change the speed limit so that everyone drives 10 miles per hour. 
That's not logical. That's not going to get us to where we're going from point A to point B. And also it will just push drivers onto other roadways. So we have to find that balance point. We have to all compromise and figure out where that's at. We also don't want to set that speed limit at 120 miles per hour while people are driving fast and not uh, holding safety as our forefront. So as we look at flood mitigation, we need to think of it the same way. We have to find the correct policies that are a balance, that are a compromise. So as we go through these, please keep that in mind and give us your feedback on where does that compromise lie. It's important for us to hear from you, especially on the topic of policy. So some of the things we're gonna cover today include what is an ordinance? We're also gonna talk about baseline policy and how this is important to Calcasieu Parish as a whole from a watershed standpoint. Gary O'Neill is gonna to talk to us a little bit about floodplain management and freeboard. I'll cover topics like no net fill and fill limitations, some things that we already have set in place in Calcasieu Parish. Also, we're gonna talk about flood map revisions, land use planning and green infrastructure. And last, we're gonna summarize these and ultimately get your feedback on which policies you think are best to put in place or to change. So we'll go ahead and get started. One of the things we're asking you through our first poll everywhere is how many webinars have you attended? We're asking this because as we go through this webinar, I can kind of streamline the discussions. I don't wanna to cover too much of things we maybe talked about in past webinars. I also wanna make sure that you're hearing stuff new if you have tend to most of most of them. So we'll give everybody just a couple of minutes to go ahead and put their, their feedback in. All right, looks like we still got a few more trickling in, but um, well, one, I'd like to thank everyone for coming back. It looks like a lot of y'all have attended most of our webinars and are you're here again because you want to hear what's going on. Um, for those that are, this is new, you know, we're going to cover some things that maybe you haven't heard. We encourage you to go back. All of our webinars, including this one, are recorded and are uh, viewable through social media as well as through the Calcasieu Parish website. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is an ordinance? Many words are interchangeable. Policy, ordinance, law, but an ordinance itself is a piece of legislation that is enacted by a municipality or an authority. An ordinance is important and it has multiple layers and components to it. One thing that is so important about an ordinance is that it allows us to have consistency, consistency across a jurisdictional boundary. That consistency is important to ensure that whatever we're doing, whatever our steps are, whether it's development, um, or just a resident building an individual home that we're consistent with our guidelines and our guiding principles as well as our goals and objectives. So we want that consistency. Another thing that I want to emphasize is that an ordinance is a living document. It's not to be set in stone. Times are changing, things are changing, and our ordinance need to be able to adapt to that. So uh, just like we're having conversations today, it's important that ordinances are looked at to ensure that they're still in line with today's practices or the current standards. So think of it as a living document. Another thing is ordinances need to be comprehensive. They need to cover everything from a large scale development all the way down to an individual homeowner. So that adds layers of complexity when writing these ordinances that they can be comprehensive in nature especially when it comes down to floodplain protection as well as stormwater control and management. Ultimately, the ordinances are there to regulate. They're there to set a law. They're there to ensure that people are abiding by what's best for the community. And lastly, that ties directly into ordinances are meant to protect the residents. That is their main purpose, is to ensure that whatever growth we have, whatever the future holds for us, that everyone here is being protected. And that's the purpose of those ordinances. So as I mentioned, it's important for our ordinances to be in line with our guiding principles and our goals and objectives. In 2015, Calcasieu Parish adopted their stormwater guiding principles for floodplain management and stormwater control. One particular one that we wanna highlight is the emphasis to protect both your private and public investments. 
We want to protect everything from the commercial developments to the homeowners to even your critical infrastructures, like your hospitals and police stations and schools. So in order for this to occur, we need to have those ordinances in place to protect these things. So one thing about ordinances is that they are jurisdictional. So they are governed by your municipality or for the parish, the unincorporated areas. These are meant for both the residents that live there as well as visitors that come in. So these different ordinances are in place. You can find your ordinances typically on Municode, which is a website that allows you to access a variety of municipalities ordinances or by contacting that municipality itself for what those what those ordinances actually are. So again, right now ordinances are very jurisdictional. And that goes on to our first topic, baseline policy. So what is baseline policy? Well, a baseline is a minimum level of standard. It's something that's set as a baseline for everyone to follow. An example of this is FEMA, a federal agency has a baseline policy for all communities that participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. That baseline policy is any home or commercial development that is located in a FEMA designated floodplain must build at a minimum to the base flood elevation or that 100 year elevation. This is their baseline policy. As a community, you have the ability to adopt something of a higher standard, a higher freeboard, but that baseline is set to ensure that everyone across that watershed, across our state and across the US are protected at a very baseline level. So that's the theory behind baseline policy. So why is it important in Calcasieu Parish? And why is it important from a watershed management standpoint? You've heard me say before, water does not see political boundaries. And that's extremely important when it comes to ordinances regarding stormwater and floodplain. So within Calcasieu Parish, we have 12 watersheds. All of these watersheds drain independently, but within each one lies various jurisdictions, various municipalities. Some of these municipalities are located individually within one watershed. Some municipalities overlap into multiple watersheds, but it's important for us to start talking about the policies and how these interact within these watersheds. I'll use the example that if a municipality has very limited stormwater or detention control. Then when a developer goes in and doesn't have to detain their water, that they're increasing their runoff from their development, then that water just pushes downstream really quickly outside of that jurisdictional boundary, but with still within the watershed. So by setting baseline policy, we ensure that everybody's working united on a level playing field. Baseline policy can be defined even further. It can be individual ordinances, such as green space, development regulations, detention pond, the design rainfall that needs to be used, no net fill or freeboard. And we're gonna talk about all of these different ones today. So each jurisdiction, we want us all to be united. We're all within Calcasieu Parish. We all live within the same watersheds. So by setting a baseline policy, we can actually step through this and at least have one working layer that we all have. Every municipality has the ability to adopt something higher than that baseline policy. So we wanted to just kind of show a few examples of how are we differing today? We chose Calcasieu Parish, the city of Lake Charles and the city of Sulphur, just as some examples and to show you kind of how we vary. All of these ordinances are great, but they differ slightly. From a development regulation standpoint, Calcasieu Parish uses what's called a full spectrum to determine how much runoff comes off of a site. Where the city of Lake Charles does this for a 10 year storm and the city of Sulphur looks at a 25 year storm. From a detention standpoint, both Calcasieu Parish and the city of Sulphur use the full spectrum analysis. The reason they look at a full spectrum analysis is to ensure that those ponds operate for a variety of events. And I'm gonna cover that in a little bit more detail where for the city of Lake Charles, they make you size it for a 25 year, but only release water at a 10 year. So again, all great ordinances, um, but if we can at least set our baseline and determine making sure everybody's working at a minimum standard, and then you can go above and beyond that is the purpose of baseline policy. 
So, another poll. When compared to Calcasieu Parish, how much more populated is Lafayette Parish? So we're gonna give everybody an opportunity to answer this. Um, we're asking this question because Calcasieu Parish is growing. In the last 10 years, you've had 11% growth. You went from being a very rural parish to now having a lot of an urbanized core. Lafayette Parish has urbanized over the years and has set additional regulations in the last five years to grow smart. So give everybody just a couple of seconds more. Okay, so the correct answer here is 20%. So Lafayette Parish is only 20% larger in population than Calcasieu Parish. And like I said, Calcasieu Parish is definitely catching up to that as well as we continue to grow. So it's important for us to ensure that our ordinance are adaptive or changing with our growth. Okay, so we're gonna dive into a couple of the ordinances and regulations that are in place and talk about some recommendations. So currently, Calcasieu Parish requires that post-development discharge be zero increase to the runoff of the pre-development. That's a lot of really fancy words, but what they're saying is that your current existing conditions, today if you've got a pasture or a grassland and it rains, that water saturates into the ground and very little runoff is released off of that site. When a development comes in and puts down things like concrete or rooftops, less water is able to saturate into the ground, resulting in more water running off into our ditches and our channels. So the current regulation says you have to detain or hold back any additional runoff on your site before it can be released. So this used to be a very standard ordinance adopted by many municipalities across the United States. But in recent years, parishes like St. Tammany and Lafayette Parish, as well as other areas in Texas and Florida have taken a step a little bit further. And what they're doing is they're requiring a reduction in that runoff. So not only do you need to detain and ensure that the water that used to go off your site is equal to what is now going off, but you need to detain anywhere from 10 to 15%. There's many reasons for this additional detaining. One is future conditions. You're gonna hear myself as well as Gary O'Neill talk about future conditions, things that we're combating, like increased rainfall, sea level rise and subsidence. So it's we wanna ensure that the pond we put down doesn't just meet today's standards, but also has additional capacity to cover future standards. Other reasonings include we have a lot of developments that went down in the past years that don't have the detention that's needed. So if we can hold back that additional water, we're helping the system as a whole, both that new development that's coming in, as well as the older developments that are out there. So this is something that is being recommended. We're recommending that Calcasieu Parish and its municipalities adopt an ordinance that requires a decrease in post-development runoff. Next, we're gonna talk about detention. So within Calcasieu Parish, you currently require detention to be designed for what's called a full spectrum of design storms. So this is looking at everything from a two year, five year, all the way up to the hundred year. So one of the things that we would note is that currently Calcasieu Parish has this ordinance in place. One thing that the parish is looking into is the use of waivers. These waivers um, are already in place and what they call it is you can get a waiver and pay a fee in lieu of detention. This is currently set at a two acre level. So anything smaller than two acres that comes in, you pay a fee in lieu of having to put detention on your site. Is two acres enough? Should it be three acres? So that is one thing that is being looked at because a lot of people are coming in and are only looking at putting their home on that site. So this is something that is considered um, as possible change in that detention requirement within Calcasieu Parish. The other reason that I wanna note is that Calcasieu Parish does look at this full spectrum to ensure that the ponds that we're putting in place are adaptive over time. And so what occurs is sometimes whenever someone designs a pond for a higher storm event, 
it actually allows those smaller small storm events, those higher intensity, quick rainfalls to actually get out of the system much faster. So by looking at the full spectrum, you're ensuring that this pond is operating under multiple conditions. So the recommendation that we have is that all municipalities at a baseline match this current Calcasieu Parish ordinance of looking at a full spectrum of storm events when looking at detention design. Next is design rainfall. So whenever we set an ordinance, you'll hear everyone talk about that pond was designed for a 25 year storm or that pond was designed for a 10 year storm or it's checked for the 100. Those values are all based on the amount of rainfall. So currently any design that's done, whether this is from a parish project all the way to a new development coming in, the current regulation requires the use of the DOTD hydraulics manual. Within the DOTD hydraulics manual, they give you information for various rain events. The one that we're showing here is an example of the 100 year, 24 hour uh, rainfall event. So this means that in 24 hours, 12.6 inches occurs cumulatively over that 24 hours, then at that point, we call that a 100 year storm. But this data included in the hydraulics manual was actually calculated and computed in the 1980s based on rainfall from the prior years. Recently, NOAA and the National Weather Service have done updates to this information. They've looked at our rainfall all the way up into 2010 and looked at over 75 years of rainfall data to determine what increments should these values be set at. This is called Atlas 14. This recent information states that in Calcasieu Parish, instead of that 12.6 inches, we should be using 14.6 inches. So why does this matter? If we say that we're designing for a 100 year storm and I only use 12.6 inches instead of that 14.6, I am not accounting for the correct amount of volume in that storm. I'm actually only detaining a 50 year storm event rather than 100. So although our ordinances are written to cover something, if we're not using the right rainfall, we're not getting the right amount of volume and storage. To add on to this, as I mentioned, Atlas 14 stops at 2010. I think everyone on this webinar would agree that since 2010, our rainfall has changed. We're seeing more frequent storms. We're seeing higher intensity. So in the state of Texas, they've gone ahead and they've analyzed the data from 2010 to 2020 and added that in. Particularly in the Houston area, they have seen increases of 35% increase in that rainfall intensity. So one of the things I would tell you is that our 14.6 could be as much as 19.7 if we take into account the past 10 years of data into this as well. Both the National Weather Service and NOAA are looking into this and going to come up with updated information. So our policy recommendation is for municipalities and Calcasieu Parish to not utilize the DOTD standard for rainfall, but rather utilize the most recent National Weather Service. So therefore, as they update their information, this information is that is, that is used for our developments. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Gary O'Neill, who is going to discuss floodplain management and freeboard. Gary comes to us as being an expert in freeboard and floodplain analysis. One of the things I will tell you is that he serves as the liaison for the Louisiana Floodplain Management Association on legislation activities. And in addition, he serves on the National Hazard Mitigation Board. So at this time, I will turn it over to Gary. Thanks, John. I appreciate the introduction. And as she said, my name is Gary O'Neill. I work for CH Finstermaker as our grants manager, but I'm also a certified floodplain manager. For today's webinar, I'm here to talk to you about two concepts, floodplain management and freeboard. Before we get into the deep dive on these two concepts and how they relate back to policy for Calcasieu Parish and its residents, 
we like to make sure that everybody's reading from the same sheet of music when it comes to these terms. So we're going to start by looking at the image on the webinar here of two, two conditions of a floodplain. We're going to define the floodplain first. FEMA defines it as any land area that's susceptible to being inundated by floodwaters from any source. This could be any stream, bayou, coulee, river, or canal in Calcasieu Parish. On the left, you see normal conditions. And on the right, when there's a flooding situation from a high intensity storm or a named storm or some type of upriver or downriver situation, and that water can't move effectively, it overtops its banks and floods into what we call the floodplain. So you see these two here. This is what's referred to as the floodplain whenever we're discussing these subjects. The next slide gives a difference between the impact of development on floodplains. When we talk about managing the interaction between the natural and the built environments within a floodplain, it's referred to as floodplain management. But on a high level, any time development occurs, whether the development is commercial in nature, whether it's residential construction, or whether if it's infrastructure to service either commercial or residential development, these changes within a floodplain to the natural environment will impact the floodplain itself, oftentimes with negative consequences for folks that already live, work, play, or worship within a floodplain. You can see in the image below, uh, when you regrade or fill water into uh, an existing area, or you insert fill into an existing floodplain, that has an impact to the existing development within that floodplain. It can actually push floodwaters into a home. It can push floodwaters into a business, or it can inundate structures, whether it's roadways, lift stations, pump stations, et cetera. When we talk about floodplain management, what we're really discussing is any community-based effort that reduces the risk of flooding for a community. It's always going to hopefully result in a more resilient community. When we define floodplain management, it's two aspects. There are structural floodplain management methods and non-structural floodplain management methods. This slide basically describes a high-level overview of the two concepts that go into floodplain management. On the left, we talk about structural floodplain management. This is any effort to control and direct the natural environment via projects or construction efforts to control the flow of water within a floodplain. You've got some examples listed above. I think these were actually appearing in a previous webinar, but you've got references like channel modifications, regional detention storage facilities, existing structure changes, or floodgates and pump stations, things we're all very familiar with here in Calcasieu Parish. On the right in green, you see non-structural floodplain management options. Non-structural floodplain management describes any effort to control the built environment, not through actual projects per se, but through regulation programs or policies. Any type of implementation with policies, processes, and procedures at the community level is referred to as non-structural floodplain management. Some examples include policy, like we're talking about today, structural elevations, which Calcasieu Parish has been involved in for the last 10 years or more, uh, dry flood proofing of residential or non-residential structures, buyout programs to acquire flood prone properties, or even open space protection to prevent further development within a sensitive area of the floodplain. All these are examples of non-structural floodplain management. When you marry non-structural floodplain management with structural floodplain management, any community should see an improvement in the risk of flood hazards to its residents and its infrastructure. But as we shift to think about floodplain management and freeboard, which we'll get into in just a second, and other policy changes, we can't just balance what we've done before against uh, those potential changes. We have to compare the floodplain of today versus what the floodplain of the future will be. Jean's previous slides referenced an increasing intensity and frequency of rain events. She also referenced the fact that certain data that we've utilized previously for our policies and procedures may not be the most accurate or the best available data to make future decisions regarding floodplain management. So as these storms continue to increase in frequency and intensity, we're also dealing with terms and new situations, new future conditions like subsidence and sea level rise. And when we take those into account with these changing conditions, our plans and our policies have to balance our need for continued growth as a community 
with development and floodplain management concepts that keep future conditions in mind. Planning now to account for changes in the future will provide the maximum level of protection for our public and private investments and our community at large. I do wanna draw attention to an example of, of what we're trying to get at here in this slide. The image on the left, the green area, is a section of Calcasieu Parish that's currently at risk in a 100-year event. Based on future conditions, you can see that the yellow and red areas are also soon to be at risk. If we look at our policies and procedures and the way that we try to impact or implement floodplain management using just current data, we're going to expose our community to risks going into the future. And so we have to take these into account and keep them in the forefront of our minds as we consider changes in policy to make sure we implement floodplain management. One of the ways we can do that is to consider an option like freeboard. Before we get into the potential options to control freeboard or floodplain management using freeboard from a policy perspective, we want to define it for you to make sure everybody's reading from the same sheet of music. Freeboard is a term used by FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program, or the NFIP, to describe a factor of safety that's usually expressed in feet above the BFE, or base flood elevation. According to the NFIP, it requires the lowest floor of any structure built in a special flood hazard area or a floodplain to be at or above this base flood elevation. A structure built with one foot of freeboard, therefore, would have its lowest floor at one foot above that, that base flood elevation, or BFE. The figure in the slide here shows two structures, one built actually below the BFE, which is the dotted blue line, one built above the BFE in the flood source, the distance between that source of flood and the lowest level of the house, which is described as house B on the slide, uh, is the actual freeboard. Currently, Calcasieu Parish calculates freeboard using a number of different methods, and we wanna describe those before we talk about future conditions and what our potential recommendations are for the parish. The lowest floor elevation for homes is determined by adding one foot to the highest of the following measurements, either the flood insurance rate map that's available for the structure in the area, or the center line of the nearest street to the structure or adjacent to the structure, or to the top of the nearest sanitary sewer manhole cover where a community or a municipal system is available, or also the highest recorded historical or modeled inundation levels for a 100 year event. As we look at the current ways we calculate freeboard though, and we take into account John's references to changing times and changing data and more increasing frequency and events, um, we see that existing flood risk today is not going to be the existing flood risk for tomorrow. These risks are gaining in terms of their existential threat to our community. And so the policies that we use today are simply not going to be effective for proper floodplain management and implementation of enough safety for our community and our public and private investments going forward in the future. Therefore, it's Finster Maker's recommendation to the Calcasieu Parish Police Jury that we change freeboard policy in the parish so that it now is the lowest floor being elevated two foot above that BFE for all commercial, residential, and infrastructure construction. Some folks may ask questions as to why this is being recommended. It's again, due to changing conditions like sea level rise, subsidence, the increase in rainfall that NOAA data gives us more accurate information on, the need for Calcasieu's continued development, unfortunately, within sometimes sensitive floodplain areas. And also, there's the recommendation from FEMA that any funding used from that agency to repair or implement mitigation measures be elevated to at least two foot, and in some cases, three foot above the base flood elevation. When you look at these federal requirements for minimum standards, you see that we wanna provide at least that baseline to our community and our infrastructure and our assets. I believe this slide is gonna show you the increase in threat from sea level rise alone. During tidal events, you see this future sea level rise it impacts all the way up into the northern reaches of the parish itself. If we look at even the low projections for future conditions from sea level rise, we see one and a half feet. If we look at more aggressive potential 
for sea level rise impacts, this could be as high as over three feet. And so what we're instituting here will provide protection, not just for our residents now, but going forward into the future as these conditions become more and more aggressively risking uh, to our community. There are costs associated with implementing a policy like this. Um, usually expressed as the cost of a home, Freeboard does increase the cost used via the foundation system. Uh, this cost is often offset though from savings from lowered insurance premiums, as well as damages that are avoided every time we deal with flooding threats. Uh, the cost of implementing Freeboard therefore is usually offset by the benefits or reduced cost of owning a home and avoiding damages over the lifetime of that home's ownership by members of the community. And again, we wanna keep in mind, FEMA is requiring any infrastructure repaired or rebuilt using its funding to be elevated to a minimum of two feet above the base flood elevation. And again, in some cases, three feet above. You see the figure on the right basically painting a simple picture. The higher you build and the farther away you bring construction away from the risk of flooding, the more downward pressure we can see on the cost of home ownership as expressed through flood insurance premiums. And it's simple. The less risky this home is to the threat of flooding, the less money you're going to pay in flood insurance. So these types of policy changes will result in providing not only protection, but also reductions in the cost of owning a home in this community over the long term. Now we're going to turn it back over to Jean Hornsby again to discuss some subjects like no net fill and fill limitations. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Gary. So tying into the free board discussions that Gary just went through, um, obviously there's many reasons of why we need to start building homes higher up. And I think many people will agree with that. But what do we do? All we're doing at that point is adding fill within the floodplain. So our solution to elevating homes isn't always the best benefit because at the same time, we're adding fill in that floodplain. So we've got to find that balance. Remember, we talked about balance in the beginning. So one thing is the use of no net fill. This is actually part of Calcasieu Parish's current ordinance and also an ordinance that is adopted by many municipalities across Louisiana. The theory of no net fill is it's meant to preserve the ability of your floodplain to store water. So the thought process is that you currently have this volume that's being taken up by a floodplain. When we add dirt, we're causing that water to just go up within that floodplain. Think of a glass of water. You've got a glass of water. It's got a level of water in there. When you add ice cubes, that water goes up. It's the same concept. When we take away that volume in that floodplain, we're causing an increase in that floodplain as well. So the use of no net fill is one of the concepts to help mitigate that. So wherever you're adding fill, you'd actually take away the same amount of volume through the use of maybe a detention or a pond area in order to offset that fill volume. Over the years, Calcasieu Parish has continued to grow and change. Here you can see this is in Lake Charles in the 1940s. A lot of agriculture, a lot of open fields. And again, remember the concept earlier, when it rains, that water would just saturate into the ground. As we've grown, developments have came into play. Not always did we have the ordinances in place to maybe set detention. Those are all newer concepts that were introduced in the late 90s, early 2000s. And you can see as we continue to grow. Here is an image of the year 2000 in that same area. In this image, I wanna point out the remaining green space that we had available. Also, you may have to squint a little bit, but look for detention ponds. If you look good, there aren't many. And we've continued to grow and develop. But with this development has also caused things like our repetitive loss and severe, severe repetitive loss homes to also increase. In this area in 2018, there was roughly 29 homes that were RLs. Now with the recent storms that we've been hit with the two hurricanes and the flood event, this area has increased to have over 140 homes in our RL list. Many of these have due to the increasing 
of filling within that floodplain, causing that water level to go up. We're going to hear from some of your locals in a news article covering just this topic. As the pictures show, the new houses are high, the old houses lower. If they would have came up a foot, it wouldn't be the problem that we have right now. But three to four feet, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Is what happens when a hurricane comes and all the water from behind all of our homes comes back into our houses again to flood? I cannot take another flood. So as you can see, this is a common problem. And it's something that's being voiced by many people. They just don't understand why homes are being built so high. Well, as Gary said, times are changing and we're getting new increases in elevations for flood protection. So part of it is our ordinances requiring people to build higher up, but they're building higher up around existing neighborhoods. Here's another example of some homes in which you've got the older homes or the homes that were built first and then a home that comes in. Some of these homes are building up because of ordinance. Some are building up because they just don't want to fight flood. Maybe they were a home that came from another area that flooded before and they feel the need to add additional fill to elevate their homes. Well, this isn't exactly appealing to the people in the neighborhood, but more importantly, it's also taking up the volume that these empty lots maybe used to have. So how do we compromise? Where is that compromise in here? We don't wanna stop development, but at the same time, we wanna ensure that building up doesn't affect others. The use of no net fill is one of those options that is in place in which we offset that. But there's also limitations on the size and waivers that are offered for people on no net fill as well. One thing that we wanna recommend is the use of fill limitation. This is something that is becoming more popular within Louisiana. When we require a home to build up, to whatever level above that base fill at elevation, many people come in and just add fill. But by incorporating a fill limitation into your ordinance, you can limit the amount of fill that's being placed. Any additional elevation on top of that would be constructed due to open space or on piers. So this allows that water to freely flow in that area without taking up the large amount of space. Yes, this is different, but it's not that different. I want you to think about the older neighborhoods in town. Think about maybe where your grandparents lived. Many of these homes were constructed on piers. They were placed on high ground and they were put on piers for many reasons. So it allowed that water to freely flow through. Also, it allowed us to, as our areas are subsiding, to continue to elevate those homes and protect them. So this isn't an old concept. It's something that's been done for many years but the thought of fill limitation is to protect the current residents around us by limiting the amount of fill. We still encourage the use of no net fill and encourage that as a baseline policy across all municipalities, but in addition, incorporating some fill limitations. Again, I want to talk about the use of adaptation. So sometimes we set things like no net fill in place across an entire parish or an entire jurisdiction. But it's important for us to listen to the community and figure out where does that make sense? Where is it appropriate? So in the Calcasieu Parish, we've talked previously about two types of flooding, the riverine flooding, where the water comes out of the channels, rain comes down, runoff, the channel itself floods. Then we also have our coastal flooding, this is what we see from our tropical storms, as well as from our hurricanes in which water is pushed in via surge. FEMA designates different zones. So they have everything from an A zone, which is the areas that are flooding due to riverine flooding. Then they have a V zone. The V zone is the areas that flood due to that coastal surge that's coming in. FEMA does not allow the placement of fill in a V zone. That is their baseline policy. However, we have this area that kind of falls in the middle here in Calcasieu Parish. They're flooding due to riverine flooding and they have a small risk of flooding during coastal events. Those coastal events, um, we call these coastal transect zones on FEMA maps. 
so one of the discussions that has been brought to the attention of Calcasieu Parish, and they're looking into further, is for these coastal transect zones, these guys that kind of fall in the middle, is doing no net fill based on their flood height from the rainfall in the riverine, rather than no net fill based on the surge values. So we bring this up because this is a policy recommendation. We think that things like this need to be looked at and determine where are they, where is it applicable? Where should it apply? And again, sometimes we have to look at the watershed itself and its topography when looking and setting these ordinances. So take that into consideration. Tying back to our previous webinar, it is great for us to say, hey, let's build higher hey, no net fill, green space, all these things. But the more that we can incentivize things like open foundation and construction that ultimately help the homeowner in the end reduce their flood insurance is extremely important. For those that attended our second webinar, we focused a lot on risk rating 2.0 and some of the things that are where your insurance is gonna be based on. Things like what kind of foundation you have, how high your home is and how close it is to the floodplain. We're no longer talking about whether or not you're in or you're out of the floodplain. But what we're looking at now is they're calculating your flood insurance premiums on all of these different things with a lot of emphasis on open space foundation. So when a developer comes in, if we can try and incentivize that they're in development, have things like open space foundation, that would definitely be something to consider. Things that they can get in place or higher density, maybe reduce setbacks. These are things to help incentivize that developer of creating a development that has open space foundation as the homes. In this image, you can see a home. I think many of us would agree that this, this is in a very aesthetically pleasing home. This house was actually changed and uh, into a commercial facility. You can see the ADA ramp there, but this home is three feet above ground. It is landscaped around and it is very aesthetically pleasing. This foundation allows for that water to completely freely flow underneath this home. So this is something as just an example of what these could look like. So again, our, open, our recommendations is to look at ordinances and try and encourage those open foundations that allow these floodwaters to continue while limiting the amount of fill placement that is being placed within the floodplain. So moving on, we're gonna talk about flood map revisions. So at first glance, this is a really busy slide, but I'd like everyone to focus on the left-hand side. This is the sulfur watershed in Calcasieu Parish. Everything you see here in red is your FEMA designated floodplain. If you pull up a FEMA map, you will only see the red areas show up as a FEMA floodplain. However, through your master planning process, models have been created for every single watershed to determine the floodplain extents within those watersheds. And the blue floodplain extents are those of the sulfur watershed. This is extremely important because when we set elevations, when a homeowner comes in and says, hey, I'm building a house, how high should I build? If you strictly only use your FEMA maps, you're missing it because a lot of times they'll say you're not in a flood zone. So there's no regulations. It's important as a community that we start to utilize the most recent data. In this case, it is your modeled data. So a zoom in on the right hand side can give you a little bit better visual thought of what this looks like and where these floodings are. So we're going to do a quick poll. How much of Calcasieu Parish is currently in the FEMA designated floodplain? Is it 31%, 65, 46, or 38? So this is what is on your FEMA flood maps. I'm giving everybody a few minutes. The data is still coming in. All right, so we got some pretty smart folks here. The correct answer is 46% is currently on your FEMA flood map. 
Um, as I mentioned, as part of this master plan, we are doing flood extent modeling um, for various storm events, particularly the 100 year event. And right now, I would tell you that I believe that number is going to tally in closer to 75 to 80 percent of your parish being within a floodplain. So, again, the point here is that just what's on the map isn't always the most accurate data. It's not that FEMA didn't do it right. FEMA is looking at this from a high level. Their purpose of those flood insurance maps was for flood insurance purposes with risk rating 2.0. They're now realizing that those gaps were leading to more flooding. So they're looking at those other standards of how close you are to flood sources and things like that. But as a community, having this information, knowing community risk is extremely important. So I'm gonna show you an example of why this is so important. So the map you're seeing here is a snip of a FEMA flood insurance map. The gray area is the FEMA floodplain as designated on a FEMA map. The zone X is often titled as I'm out of the floodplain. Um, I'll tell you here in Louisiana, no one's out of the floodplain, really. This is just a lower risk of flooding within this area. In this case, this area just wasn't studied by FEMA. It wasn't on a main channel. But if you were a developer and you're looking for a great safe place to build a development, wouldn't you identify this area? as a prime location? Well, when a 2012 flood event hit the city of Karen Crow, this entire neighborhood went underwater. Many of these homeowners had only been in their home weeks. So I will tell you that since the 2012 flood event, the city of Karen Crow has taken steps. They've adopted higher freeboard standards. In fact, their freeboard ordinance um, was adopted based on Calcasieu parishes. And in addition, they've done a comprehensive model of the area that allows them to identify areas outside of the FEMA flood zones. And they utilize that information that's been produced for developers and homeowners to ensure that they're building to a higher level of standard. So as a community, it's your job to ensure that homeowners know a risk and can build to the appropriate elevation that is needed. So in Calcasieu Parish's place, we've seen a lot of change, not always positive. So one thing is our flood maps have allowed us to build in areas that aren't necessarily, they're, they're there to develop, but we just have to develop smart. And over the years, our maps have not always led us in that direction. So at the bottom of the screen, you see blue and red. The red is the FEMA floodplain that's on our FEMA maps. The blue is an area located in Lake Charles that is determined to be in a floodplain based on the recent models generated as part of this master plan. Over the last few years, we've seen a huge increase in our repetitive loss claims. You will have seen this in multiple um, presentations that we give, but we just kind of wanted to show you the impact of developing in an area without having the appropriate free board or using the best available data. Um, in this area, you can see the increase of RLs and SRLs as they've gone from black, which in 2018, there were only just a few homes in this neighborhood, all the way up to 2021, where now you can see the red and the yellow include all the homes that have entered into that repetitive loss. We can prevent this from happening. Having ordinances in place and ha using our best available data is important to preventing this from occurring time and time again. In this particular neighborhood, there was not a project that we could look at that could help mitigate this flooding. There wasn't a levy, there wasn't increasing of pumps. The only way was to buy out and elevate these homes. So at this point, what we're recommending is for Calcasieu Parish and the municipalities to do two things. One is start taking the steps forward to having FEMA adopt your maps as the more accurate standard. And additionally, as the communities, you can begin using the modeled information that you have to regulate. You can adopt this into your ordinance as best available data. So within Calcasieu Parish, there are many benefits um, for taking the steps through FEMA. 
Um, one such thing is you'll get CRS credits. The minute that FEMA adopts and sees that your best available data is valid, they do a review, an extensive review process, and they create the maps. Um, for them, this, this does give you credit for that CRS. Remember, the more CRS points we get, the more discount homeowners receive from their premiums. Another benefit is that FEMA will eventually require you to do this anyway. So at some point in time, FEMA is going to come in and require an update of maps. Usually this occurs on like a 10 year ish cycle. Um, and so if you have that data available, you're allowing to say, hey, look, here's our information. This is what we as our community has designated as our FEMA floodplains. In addition, homeowners can get more FEMA assistance in a natural disaster when they're located in a designated FEMA flood zone. And as a parish, you also will get more money to protect those people that are located in the FEMA flood zone. Um, those people take priority a lot of times over others. So having and being in that zone does help from a mitigation standpoint um, financially, especially after a disaster. The good news is you're pretty much halfway through the process anyway. Um, when FEMA would have came in, they do what's called a physical map revision. Um, they look at project planning, see what information is available. They develop models. Um, right now, those models are developed. The next step would actually be to identify what those maps look like. You submit them to FEMA. FEMA does an extensive review of the models as well as the maps. And then they issue um, a letter of final determination for those maps to become um, part of the system. So this is kind of the process. You've already started it and began this process already. So the next topic we're going to cover is land use planning and green infrastructure. You might wonder why are we talking about land use planning under policy? Well, land use codes and land use um, maps are quite uh, important when it comes to ordinances and policy. Some things that they do is that they can encourage different types of development in different areas. One such way is to try and protect your floodplain as much as possible. You've heard us talk in previous webinars about open space, green space, protection along our channels. By tying this into your land use planning, it's known that areas around major channels are meant for agricultural use, parks and recreation, walking trails, greenways. As you get a little bit further out, your flood risk decreases slightly. Those are areas that you might want to do single family homes, maybe a home on a three acre site or a one acre site. As you get further out, your level of risk reduces and therefore your density of housing should increase. Um, this is a concept that is really big in, across the US, especially in major developing areas. Um, and it's something that we've done a pretty good job of, but Again, we do have a lot of communities that are, are still allowing developments to build right up on a channel, taking away that floodplain, taking away that, that natural system. So the use of land use planning can help to regulate this and to help guide us into that direction. So tying into land use planning is the use of green infrastructure or green space. Uh, green space is a common ordinance that's placed within many municipalities, um, but tying into that is the use of green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's grass, it's the use of trees, it's putting vegetation in place that can absorb the water faster without allowing it just to run off. Things like parks, rain gardens, pedestrian paths, um, the use of recreation like soccer fields can all be placed as green infrastructure. In addition, we're going to cover some other examples. The pictures here kind of show you rather than just putting down a whole bunch of pavement, adding that green space. This also adds tree canopy to our system as well. When you add tree canopy, you also reduce the temperatures in the area for those walking or and things like that. So all of these aspects can tie together in helping to reduce the amount of water that we're dealing with. Um, someone once told me, you know, well, all of these things, they just, they seem so little. They're not gonna make a difference on the big system. Well, think of it as having, you know, that glass of water. And every time that we can just take a drop or two out 
and, and preserve that, you're helping the system. So all of these help to contain the water rather than just pushing it into our channels, overwhelming them and flooding our streets and homes. So some examples of green infrastructure. Um, one that is becoming more popular is the use of rain gardens. New Orleans has had a really great success with this, of incorporating this into a lot of their parks. Um, the way a rain garden works is that it can absorb 30% more water um, than the same size area of a lawn. So what this includes is using the proper amount of rock. They do a lot of different types of vegetations. Um, and this type of information will be made available on our story map for those that might have interest. Another thing is that rain gardens um, are aesthetically pleasing. In our last webinar, Jennifer talked a lot about the buyout program and having these open space lawn areas. By incorporating things like rain gardens, um, you can absorb more water, you can hold it um, for a longer period of time, again, detaining it, waiting for it to release. Um, we've also seen a lot of um, communities start off with their public facilities implementing some of these features. The more people see it, the more that they see how it works, um, and the more that we can incorporate it into our day-to-day -day features like our homes and our businesses. Calcasieu Parish has done just that. Um, currently under construction is the Ham Reed Road Extension. Uh, this project was worked directly with a landscape architect. Yes, we built a road and we brought in a landscape architect. That's correct. That landscape architect helped to ensure that the trees, the vegetation, everything along the route could help absorb as much water as possible. Hamry Road will be lined with walking trails that kind of meander amongst detention, rain gardens, and other ways to infiltrate that water trying to reduce the amount of runoff that is caused by the increase in pavement here. So starting at the government level and looking for opportunities to add these green, green infrastructure elements into our projects is extremely important. I would encourage your recreation departments to also consider this. This is a great opportunity to add green infrastructure into your parks and recreation departments um, that are already active green space. But you can take that green space and you can turn it into more. So let's just, the more that we're thinking in this direction, the more that we'll see it becoming a common feature. So as always, how can we incentivize this? So you can always put it into policy, but usually the most, <laughs> the most beneficial way of getting things done is to incentivize it, encourage people to do this. So things we talked about during our programs tied to that green infrastructure element were property tax exemptions, um, flexibility on road width, and increase in density. Um, just recently, I got a developer that submitted a set of plans to me. We sat back down with the developer and we said, hey, what if instead of putting homes right next to that channel, what if we lined it with open green space? What if we added additional detention into this area? This actually increased their housing values, um, you know, and allowed them to get higher price values at the same time protecting and preserving that floodplain. So in addition, we like to tie it all back together. This too can improve our CRS rating by adding these green infrastructure elements into our projects, whether they're on the public side, commercial side, or as a resident. So we're gonna go ahead and summarize a lot of this information. Many of these topics we probably could have talked much longer on. I know you got hit with a lot of information today on a lot of different topics, but um, we are definitely interested in your feedback. It's important that you give us that feedback through the surveys. If for some one of these is appealing and you wanna hear more about it, let us know. We can always set up a specialized webinar on a particular topic. But in summary, we talked a lot about baseline policy. Many of the ordinances we talked about, we talked about determining what is the baseline. What is the baseline for Calcasieu Parish as a whole from a watershed standpoint and incorporating that throughout your municipalities and throughout your parish. Next, we talked about development regulations and we recommended that decrease in runoff. It's important for us to start fixing our sins of the past. I don't really don't have a better way of putting it. We did not have regulation in place. So we can 
help by adding additional detention. This can also help, help us offset what that future looks like. It's a future of unknowns for us, but based on the where we've been going, we know things are getting not better. So if we can detain more water, that's a plus for everyone. Again, detention design, ensuring that all municipalities are looking at the same system and that these detention ponds are working as they should. Being in place to actively work for not just an individual storm event, but a full spectrum. That design rainfall, I hope you felt the importance of that. We need to use the best available data, the newest data. And if we have it and it's easily accessible, Let's add that to our ordinance to ensure that we're designing for what we think we are. We want to get that 25 year amount of storage. So, and also no net fill. This is another one that I'll tell you is probably the hardest to regulate. It is in place. The parish is looking at different changes to the no net fill ordinance. One of the things that we would like to promote is that fill limitation. Fill is great. We want to increase homes and elevate them, but we do not want to do this at the detriment of those people already living here. Flood map revisions. I'll tell you the most important thing I want you to get out of this is that it's important for communities to regulate on the best available data. You have models, you have the floodplain information. Don't just rely on what's on that FEMA flood map, but rely on your best available data. Green infrastructure, again, you heard us talk about this in previous webinars. It's important because these little bitty, little bitty elements add up and over time, they can help reduce the amount of runoff that we have. Land use planning, let's preserve that floodplain as much as possible, encouraging development in those high and dry areas and preserving those for recreation, open space and those types of things. And lastly, freeboard. Gary hit on this, and for me, this is probably the most important. We've got to stop building our problems. When the home you build today does not need to be the home that we're elevate, elevating in 50 years. We want to ensure that these homes that we are placing on the ground are built to an elevation that can last over time. As part of our pilot study, we worked with Del Torres of the Netherlands. And one of the biggest things that came out of that was that yes, projects are great, but a lot of times projects have design lives. Our culverts become undersized with time. Our pumps are not pumping at the, the capacity that's needed today. But when we elevate a home, we get a lasting effect of protection for these people. So for me, this is probably one of the biggest ones. And having that free board ordinance across municipalities and across our parish is extremely important. So at this time, we'd like to do our final poll. So based on today's presentation, please select three of these policies for Calcasieu Parish to focus on. All right, lots of really good input here. <laughs> it's kind of like a race. Some some lead and another one's full pull back. So um. all right, I think people are locking in pretty good right now. So development regulations. Yes, I agree. That is something we need to focus on. Um, protection of of the people that live here today. Um, many of these kind of tie together. So definitely um, we appreciate your feedback. I do encourage you to go onto the survey because you'll be able to give more input into maybe why you select these and which ones um, are most important going forward. So what's next? Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, this webinar series is meant to get your feedback. We're taking this feedback and we're incorporating it into our final report of recommendations that will be presented to the police jury. From here, they're gonna do, um, we wanna ensure that this plan can, isn't just a standalone plan. It needs to be part of your overall strategic plan. So they're gonna do an amendment to that and it would just be an addition to, we just are ensuring that they're working together and that they're in line. Um, so that's kind of the next steps. 
there is definitely going to need to be more talk on policy. This is something that requires a lot of feedback from politicians, from constituents, um, from groups. We value that information. Uh, again, you're living here. You're dealing with these ordinances. Where Where is that balance? Where is our compromise? And so we need to figure that out. Um, but I think it's important, and I, I commend Calcasieu Parish for taking the steps of noticing that we do need to adapt and change, and ordinances are part of that those changes. So again, I'd like to remind everybody that our final webinar will be September 7th um, at the same time. Again, you'll have the QR codes for the survey, the story map, as well as um, the next webinar at the end of this. But at this time, we'll open it up to any questions that we may have received. Um, okay, so we did receive a few questions. Um, the first one is for you, Sean. Can you compare the benefits of elevating with fill versus raising the structure on piling? So some of the benefits, wait, so it's the benefits of which Can you one? compare the benefits <laughs> of elevating with fill versus okay. raising the structure on piles? All right, well, I'm going to duel this one with Gary because mm -hmm. Gary has um, some pretty good experience of, of dealing with this as well. You can step into the, the camera. But um, for me, there there is a balance of both the, the fill and the pier elevation. Of course, from the hydraulic standpoint, um, when you build on piers, it's allowing that water to go through rather than taking up the floodplain. I'm gonna allow Gary to kind of comment on some of the more construction side of things. Uh, there's research ongoing at the FEMA level as well as the state level regarding cost differences in terms of foundation system construction types. Um, obviously from a floodplain management perspective, you want the water to be able to flow freely underneath any structure, whether it's uh, anything in a floodplain or outside. We know that uh, right next to an X zone, there's usually an A zone. So we would prefer from a floodplain management perspective, an open space foundation system type. As far as construction costs and differences, there's a nominal difference in construction. When you look at the cost of slab on grade or the utilization of fill with a concrete slab versus pier and beam construction. However, comma, we know that pier and beam construction typically reduces the impact of a chronic flooding event in terms of losses that are avoided. When you're elevating a structure using an open space foundation system, you're also not adding to the floodplain slowly but surely and extending that risk out to your neighbors and your, uh, your the rest of your community. Uh, so there's a savings that you achieve when you're using an open space foundation system. When we look at new rating factors as a result of risk rating 2.0, uh, typically there was only the elevation certificate uh, which asked for your current elevation, the base flood elevation, and then what your flood zone was. Nowadays, risk rating 2.0 takes into account a number of different factors, including the construction type and the foundation system type. We're seeing some of the largest decreases in terms of policy quotes whenever structures are being quoted with an open space foundation. And so there's going to be a reduction in the cost of home ownership over the life of owning that structure whenever you favor or whenever a community might try to push for policies or procedures that favor an open space foundation system. So there's a give and take. There's a there's definitely cost increases associated with that slab on grade or excuse me with pier and beam versus slab on grade. I would say in my opinion those are nominal and when out when weighed against the benefits of open space foundation systems though the latter far outweighs the benefits of the form. Okay, um, we have a few more questions. Um, the next one is, can you review again what you mean by baseline policy and talk about how close our communities are on their baseline right now? Um, so from the baseline policy, again, this is probably one of the ones that we're going to have to have the most collaboration on because it doesn't necessarily mean that what the parish has is the baseline. Setting that baseline policy amongst all communities um, needs to be a collaborative effort. I would tell you that from a stormwater standpoint, it's not that far off. Everyone has something relatively close in place um, to just different levels. From a freeboard standpoint, um, I'll tell you some of our communities within Calcasieu Parish go with the base of FEMA, just saying that, hey, build to the BFE. 
So I think that's definitely one of those that we can see improvement for that baseline policy of ensuring that the, those homes protected, whether you're in a municipality or in a parish um, for new construction. And then also um, there is some variances that we've noticed in the no net fill um, is another one. And even from a redevelopment standpoint, don't just think of new development. We've got a lot of older areas that are being redeveloped. So green space is another one that I've noted um, that maybe when a old grocery store or um, old Walmart is coming in and we're taking that facility and changing its use, um, incorporating green space into that could be something that is set as a baseline policy, again, to reduce that amount of, of runoff over the watershed. So I tell you, there are some ordinances that I tell you we're not that far off, that everybody's pretty close and in line, um, especially over the last five years. We've seen a lot of a lot of changes with the municipalities. Kudos to everyone that's been working on that, because I know that's not always an easy push. Um, but I think if we can all just get on one base page, that would be um, a great starting point for the parish as a whole. Awesome. Um, and I think there's one more question. What other municipalities in Louisiana have adopted BFE plus two feet? So within Louisiana, um, you can see communities both uh, north and south Louisiana. You know, a lot of people think flooding and only think south Louisiana, but um, we have everything from Ruston has a two foot free board all the way down into Jefferson Parish. Um, many of their municipalities have a two foot free board in addition to areas um, outside of their levee that have a two foot free board, St. Tammany Parish, some of their municipalities have adopted the two foot free board. Um, I think there's a municipality in Ascension Parish as well as East Feliciana. What was the other one? I believe it's East Feliciana. East, East Feliciana. Thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, so we have, um, we are seeing more communities coming on to this two foot. Gary mentioned earlier that FEMA is requiring that additional two feet. You'll see um, some of the communities, I would tell you, that got hit really hard from 2016. Um, I've seen adopt that and kind of um, go with that higher level of protection in their, their particular municipalities. Um, Parish-wide, I believe only one parish has done it parish-wide. Um, but again, many of your municipalities, growing municipalities, I want to state at that, have um, adopted that additional two foot free board. Awesome. Okay, well, I think that concludes the questions. Okay. Um, if you want to just touch on the yeah. QR codes before we conclude? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as always, the QR codes are up on the screen. Um, these include everything from your post webinar survey. Again, thank you to everyone that's participated in these over the last webinars. We've gotten some really um, great feedback, some thoughts from everyone. This information will all be put together and is going to be part of what we are submitting to the police jury based on recommendations. So your voice will be heard. So please contribute. Um, in addition, that session four webinar um, on projects, please come back and attend this one in September. And in addition, the project story map, please continue to go back to this we're adding resources. There's other information that is being added to this as you go. Push it out. Let your neighbors know. It's a great source of information. Um, a lot of stuff here that you can, can scroll through and get informed. So please um, do that as well. Yes, and I want to add to that. Um, any questions that were not answered today will be answered on the resources tab of the story map in um, the following days. So y'all can check in on that. All right. Well, we again, we thank everyone for attending and we look forward to your participation in the future webinars. Thank you.